man, you got those videos, right? Welcome to BIA Media, Canada's top black media provider. Whether you're looking for content on fashion, art, music, or simple lifestyle, we bring you the best the black community in Ottawa has to offer, and so much more. And better yet, do you have a project you need help with? Well, look no further. We provide equipment, studio, and office space, as well as a team of dedicated individuals to help you bring those ideas to life. So don't wait. Check out our new website at biamedia.ca for more information on how to contact us and start creating today. BIA Media. Your media, your way. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to session six of our course, Early History of the African Renaissance from 1896 to the Present. Um, we're going to cover a lot of information today, and most of it will cover the years between the late 1960s and up to the 1980s. Or actually, we'll go up to around right at 1980, 1970, and then we will uh, uh, stop. A lot of information to cover today, and it's going to tie right into what we talked about last week. So last week, we looked at the work by, actually, we looked at two works. First, we looked at the Battle of Algiers, and then we looked at A Man of the People by Chinua Achebe, which talked about, one, independence, particularly independence from uh, settler colonies, and then the second piece talked about what independence immediately looked like in many African countries. Because remember, A Man of the People, the country was never identified. It was a composite country. It had aspects of Nigeria, aspects of Kenya, aspects of Ghana, Ghana so on and so forth. But essentially, what we saw in that book was the takeover of the independence movement and newly independent nations by certain African leaders that weren't concerned about the masses of the people. And then we also talked about what happened to those African leaders that were actually concerned about the masses of the people, the Patrice Lumumbas, the Kwame Nkrumahs, the Seiko Therese, the Modibo Keita, so on and so forth, Julius and Yeres. Some of them were able to survive the, the onslaught that came with uh, Western imperialism attempt, attempting to reassert itself through military coups and assassinations and things like that, uh, and some succumbed. So we're going to talk about right now the end of the 1960s, and we're going to talk about how one work in particular, we're going to focus on one work today, uh, really captured the mood of the African masses around the world in the 19, late 1960s and 1970s. And that book that we'll get into today. If click it, please. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Is the groundings with my brothers by Dr. Walter Rodney. We're going to talk about today who Walter Rodney was and what was the significance of this short book, which is a collection of lectures and speeches given by Dr. Walter Rodney uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, how did the groundings reflect the concept of black power and black consciousness in the 1970s? Now, I know if my brother David H. is on the line. <laughs> he loves talking about this concept of black. But this is the time period where black power and black consciousness becomes global. And it is a qualitative shift in what, how people are thinking about themselves. We're going to get into it. What, what does black power mean? What did it mean by its advocates? How did it affect the Caribbean? How did it affect the US? And how did it even affect Africa? And we're going to talk about black consciousness as well, which are two interconnected ideas, black power and black consciousness. And lastly, we will look at the Ethiopian revolution and how it connects to the ideas of black power. The ideas of black consciousness and class struggle and class consciousness and, and the African world described by Rodney and others during the time. So we're going to look at Walter Rodney. We're going to look at Haile Selassie. We're going to look at Kwame Ture, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael today, all within the context of the African world in the late 1960s and 1970s. So Walter Rodney, born 1942, died in 1980. 
Uh, before I get into who Walter Rodney was, I just want you to hear a little bit uh, from Walter Rodney. So we don't have a lot of video footage available for Walter Rodney, but we have a few clips that are available on YouTube. And I already uh, sent one to Daniel so that you can see Dr. Walter Rodney, who's a historian, talk about, he's going to kind of give a review of what we talked about last week from his perspective. And this speech is from 1978, I believe. Uh, so, and I think it was at Howard University. So Daniel, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up. If you could go to 13, I think it's 13 minutes. We see that there is another aspect that one does not sit back and assume that this national independence per se, in and of itself, means that either the day-to-day -day social life of the African and Caribbean peoples has improved or that they have assumed any greater control over their production, over their culture, over their future. This, this assumption would be false. We have to be, in a way, having accepted the, the validity and vitality of the revolutionary nationalist movement, we now have to become self-critical of that movement and to see its basic shortcomings. The movement produced African rulers. Someone was telling me not long ago about a rather crude, racist joke which is popular in Zambia. But in spite of its crudity, it makes a certain point. And what it does is it, it simulates a conversation between a white who is a, an engineer in Zambia. Because the Zambians have a lot of white engineers, South Africans. So this South African African of white engineer in Zambia supposedly goes home to the Republic of South Africa and meets Vorster, the former prime minister, who was his boyhood friend. They hadn't seen each other for a long time, and he didn't know what Vorster was doing, so they were exchanging information. And he says, well, I'm an engineer, and Vorster says, well, since you went away, I became Prime Minister of South Africa. And he says, oh, where I come from, that's a black man's job. No, a kind of crude racist joke, but if you know South Africa, you get the point. You know South Africa. So it's a black man's job nowadays, Prime Ministerships. We have a lot of black Prime Ministers. The Washington Post was describing the vice, the vice, Second, what, what's his official position? The Deputy Prime Minister of Guyana as a large black man. So we have, <laughs> we have black men of all shapes and sizes who are Prime Ministers. And in a certain sense, that doesn't carry us very far. We want to see what substantial changes, if any, what movement is taking place within the African and Caribbean world today with respect to its location to the same international system into which we know that we have been located. And one has to be quite sobering in this because looking at it realistically, there is not a lot to shout about. There is not a lot to celebrate. The role of Africa and the Caribbean in the, in the international system has been becoming more and more marginalized, more and more peripheral, in fact, frankly regressive. There is nothing to shout about, nothing to celebrate. Thank you, Daniel. That's it. We, we were integrated into the world. So that's Walter Rodney in 1978 talking about what we talked about last week. Independence came. We had a number of black presidents and prime ministers in Africa and the Caribbean, but not a lot has changed for the African masses. And Walter Rodney, throughout his entire life, he only lived to be 38, and we'll talk about his death. He only lived to be 38 years old, but he dedicated his life to the African working masses. Those people that get up every day, they work, they try to make the living, they try to do the best they can, they don't exploit other people. 
whether they're in the Caribbean, whether they're in North America, whether they're in Africa. That's who Dr. Walney, Walter Rodney dedicated his life to. He's most well known for his probably greatest contribution to African history, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, which was published in 1972. This book is a must own. If you want to understand why Africa is in the state that it is in today and how it got there and, how, and the fact that this is not some just natural historical occurrence, this is the book to read. This book runs through slavery, it runs through colonialism. It's economic, it's political, and it's historical. And it talks about what actually happened that Europe was able to develop, America was able to develop, America's just an extension of Europe, Canada's just an extension of Europe, was able to develop so rapidly between the 16th century and the, the 20th century, and how Africa was underdeveloped. It's not an accident. If somebody comes into my house and they take my TV, they take all the appliances, they take all the cash in the house, and then they come back the next day and they say, hey, why are you poor? What kind of question is that? This book has the answer to that. This is how Europe underdeveloped Africa. And well-researched, he was a brilliant historian. So a little bit about his life. He was born in Guyana from parents that were incredibly active in political circles in Guyana. Now, Guyana was under the control of the British. So we're talking about British Guyana, not French Guyana, um, in South America. He graduates from the University of West Indies Mona campus in 1961. So that's in Jamaica. 1961, he graduates. He then goes to school, uh, gets his master's and his PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London in 1966, a prestigious European institution. Here he learns how to combine political economy with history. He takes that study and he publishes his first uh, published work is actually on his, uh, his thesis, which was on the uh, slave trade in Upper Guinea. And he looks at it from the perspective of the people in Upper Guinea, in Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, that, that area of West Africa. He then goes on to teach in Tanzania at the University of Dar es Salaam between 1966 and 1967. And the way he's teaching history is, is combining, again, economics, politics, a materialist analysis of history, meaning how do we look at history to see these patterns of economic relations and, and uh, domination versus rebellion and all these different things from the aspect of African people. And he's in Tanzania, which is no coincidence. At the time, Tanzania, the prime minister is Julius Nyerere. Tanzania is one of the more progressive African countries where the leadership is actually attempting to do right by the masses of, of people. So all the development plans, all the economic plans, the political decisions are made with the best interests of the people in mind. That was what Julius Nyerere wanted to do. And Julius Nyerere, unlike many of his other uh, uh, contemporary African political leaders voluntarily decided he wasn't going to run for another term and said that I'm going to serve my time and then someone else could take over. That set up a, a pretty good legacy in Tanzania. We didn't have a whole lot of um, military coup. You didn't, I don't think Tanzania has ever had a military coup. Uh, not a lot of political instability because of the example set by Julius and Yeri. And this trickled down to the university. This was one of the most radical universities in the world at the time, the University of Dar es Salaam. You had these radical scholars that were coming, reshaping African history, reshaping African philosophy, and using it to serve, again, the African working masses. So he's there for two years. He would go back to the University of, of Tanzania in 1969. But today's discussion is going to focus on what happened between 1967 and 1969. And that's when he goes back to his alma mater, the University of the West Indies in Jamaica, in 1968. He, go, he starts working there in January 1968. When he gets to Jamaica, he continues to work with the African masses. He gets to Jamaica, he has this very prestigious position teaching history at the university, and he goes out into Kingston. And he's, when the book is called The Groundings with My Brothers. The reason why it's given that title is because groundings are these meetings, these informal gatherings of working class Jamaican folks, particularly Rastafarians and others. And we'll talk about what Rastafarianism is in, in a second. But you had these groups of people working class people, youth, that might have been affiliated with gangs. You had uh, people that, you know, the government 
just kind of threw away, people that lived in the slums, people that came from the countryside and, and moved to the city and couldn't find work. And you had Rastafarians, and you had all these and, and radical youth leaders. And they would get together and have these groundings, these informal gatherings where they would talk about politics, and they would talk about history, and they would talk about economics. And Walter Rodney would join these meetings. And he wasn't joining to dominate the conversation, like, oh, I got a PhD, and I can tell you this, and I can tell you. No, he listened most of the time. He listened to the Rastafarians talk about Babylon, which is what, what Jamaica and the West as a whole were, was called. Rastafarianism, in a nutshell, is very, it's a very complex spiritual system, but it emerges in the 1930s. The name Rastafarianism comes from Ras Tafari. Ras meaning prince, Tafari is, is a first name from Rastafari Makonan, who would become Haile Selassie. When Haile Selassie was crowned emperor of Ethiopia in 1930, this was a sign to African people all over the world. This was, I, I, I keep making this connection because it's so, it fits so much. Ethiopia at the time was the real life Wakanda. Black people around the world loved Ethiopia, going back to 1896 when they beat the Italians and were the only African country not colonized. So when a king was crowned, an emperor was, cr was crowned in Ethiopia in 1930, black people all over the world got to see the newsreel, because back then, you know, when things happened, it wasn't on TV, they would film it on film, and then that film would go all around the world. So black people would go to movie theaters, and they could see a real-life black king and queen being crowned. So, you know, people had that, people got all, you know, happy and stuff, or some people were, when that, that king got crowned in England a couple of weeks ago and they had a lot of stuff. Well, imagine black people around the world who were being brutalized under colonization. This is the 1930s, and facing Jim Crow racism and segregation everywhere, and they get to see a black king on screen, a real life black king. So people loved Haile Selassie. And then it even increased because five years later, after he was crowned emperor, the Italians come back to Ethiopia and they invade Ethiopia. And then that just made black people all over the world upset. And it's like, this is our last place. This is our last bastion of freedom. And the Italians are coming back. Black people all over the world wanted to go fight to defend Ethiopia. And Ethiopia was ultimately able to get its freedom back from the Italian occupation. But during that entire process, a group of men in Jamaica decided that Haile Selassie's crowning of becoming emperor was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. So they looked at Haile Selassie as a divine figure, because if you know anything about the rulers of Ethiopia, they say that they, are, they were descendants of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, those biblical figures. And out of that union came the rulers of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie being in that line, in the line of Solomon, in the line of David. So he was connected to biblical figures. So the Rastafarians, as they emerged in Jamaica in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, they assigned to Haile Selassie these divine characteristics. We'll get back to that in a minute. But because of that, they rejected British colonialism. They rejected a neo-colonial Jama independent Jamaican state. And they always rallied against that. Now, some Rastafarians actually went and moved to Ethiopia, repatriated to Ethiopia. Haile Selassie gave groups of Rastafarians land in Ethiopia to live. The ones that stayed in Jamaica and that went to other places like the US and to, to the UK, they had an adversarial relationship with the state. They said, the state is Babylon. The state is evil. The state is trying to corrupt and exploit the black man. And our only salvation is with this new religion that has Haile Selassie at its center. So Rodney would meet with the Rastafarians. He would meet with the people that were upset with what Jamaica had become since independence. He, so the authorities in Jamaica didn't like this. And we'll get to that. So while he's meeting with, he's having these groundings with, with all these folks, he's under the watch of the special branch of the Jamaican police, as well as the military. So it's almost like uh, the Jamaican CIA are watching his activities. When he was a student in the mid 1960s, he was being watched by the British because of his activities were considered radical. The United States had a file on Walter Rodney. 
monitoring his activities because they saw him as a potential radical, a potential organizer, and a threat to their interests. So the U.S. had a foul on Walter Rodney, the British had a, a secret foul on Walter Rodney, and the Jamaican government had a foul on Walter Rodney. And now Jamaica is independent at this time. Remember, we have to say that because this is what he's talking about. We say we got all these black prime ministers and black leaders, but yet they're monitoring the activities of this black man and other radical black folks. So he gets to back, and he's doing all this work between January and October 1968, building with the brothers and sisters. He calls it groundings with my brothers, but there were sisters there as well, including his wife, who was uh, pregnant at the time. And he's building with the working class people in Jamaica and the people in the slums and the youths and all that. This is the, during the same time that Bob Marley and Peter Tosh are also getting introduced to Rastafarianism, and they're creating a music that is going to span the entire world, this radical music, this radical reggae that is going to catch on all over the world and make Peter Tosh and Bob Marley and, and Bunny Whaler and the Whalers um, the first super, quote unquote, first superstars from the third world. And all this is happening at the same time. October 1968, Walter Rodney gets an invitation to come to Canada. And he comes to Montreal. And he comes and he attends the Congress of Black Writers in 1968 in Montreal. Now, this is a very radical time in the African world, 1968. What has happened in 1968? April 1968, April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. April 4th, 1968 in Tennessee. Around March 1968, either March or May 1968, two, uh, four uh, uh, Freedom fighters are hung in Zimbabwe, in what was then called Rhodesia, by the white Rhodesian government in 1968. There are riots all over the United States when Martin Luther King is killed. Student movements all over the world are in very radical moves. They're uh, uh, rebelling against governments. The anti-war movement is happening. So all this is very revolutionary times in the world. And what's on the lips of most of the black youth and the black students is this idea of black power. So this is a black power conference. And at this conference, you have people like Stokely Carmichael, who's going to become Kwame Ture. You have people like Barbara Jones, who was a student in Montreal. And it was the Montreal West Indian community and the students at McGill that started this, uh, this Congress and brought these black power figures together. And in fact, the Congress was dedicated to the lives of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. You see Malcolm X poster in one of the images there. So Walter Rodney is there, and he gives this speech called African History in the Service of the Black Liberation, because this is li liberation times. That's what's on the minds of these young people. They say, we got independence, but the masses didn't get liberation. We got black prime ministers, we got this, but the masses aren't free and they're not developing. So how can we get together and figure out what we're going to do? And the fact that they had this in Canada alarmed the Canadian government, because the Canadians are like, oh, what are you talking about? There's no racism in Canada. And the black power folks in Canada coming from Nova Scotia and Toronto and Montreal are like, nah, yes, there is. And we're going to expose it. And we're going to have this meeting. We're going to bring together the most radical thinkers in the African world right to Montreal. And they did that. And it was a very successful conference. So he gets there. Um, and yeah, his, his speech was African history in the service of black liberation, which we've talked about in past courses. We're going to talk about the man sitting next to him to his right. Uh, soon. That's, that's Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, another son of the Caribbean. So you got a brother from Guyana, you got a brother from Trinidad, and they're making these speeches in Montreal, in, uh, in Canada, in October 1968. Well, October 5th, 1968, the conference is over. Walter Rodney's on his way back to Jamaica. His plane touches down in Kingston. The government of Jamaica does not allow him to leave the plane. They say, Walter Rodney, you are banned from Jamaica. This is a black prime minister. This is, this is uh, the prime minister is uh, Shearer. Shearer, uh, uh, that's how you pronounce his name, Shearer. Tells, no, you can't come back to Jamaica. You're banned. Don't even get off the plane. The plane had to go back and, and take him to Canada. Meanwhile, his, preg his wife is pregnant in Jamaica. So he can't even get off the plane to, to see his wife, any of that. They banned Walter Rodney from re-entering Jamaica. The reason for the ban was this. The prime minister said, we think Walter Rodney, who is, again, he's a, he's a university historian, 
He said, because of his actions, we've been monitoring him, and we think Walter Rodney is planning some type of Cuban-style communist revolution in Jamaica. He's meeting with these so-called Rastafarians. He's meeting with these working class people. He's meeting with Claudius Henry, who was this radical pastor in Jamaica who had been accused of, of, of murder and, and, and different things and served some jail time. But he had a following of people that were just upset with how they were being treated by the government and their lack of opportunities. And there were a number of worker strikes in Jamaica. The bus drivers went on strikes and other people went on strike. So it was a radical mood in Jamaica. And the prime minister said, Walter Rodney is somebody that's trying to stir up trouble in Jamaica. He's trying to start a violent revolution in Jamaica. Therefore, we're banning him. Not only we're banning him, we're banning books. We're banning anything that stinks of black power. The book Black Power by Stokely Carmichael, banned. Any writings on Malcolm X, banned. Anything by Elijah Muhammad, banned. They banned all these books. And again, these are black folks. These are black prime ministers, not white folks. Jamaica's supposedly independent, but this is what they're doing. Walter Rodney couldn't, couldn't come back to Jamaica. He ends up going uh, uh, home to Guyana. He eventually goes back to Tanzania. But then he writes this book, The Groundings with My Brothers, talking about the situation. It's a number of lectures. So that's the first thing he talks about in the book, is the banning and what it meant. And he writes this at the beginning of chapter 6. The government of Jamaica, which is Garvey's homeland, and we talked about Marcus Garvey and the impact he had on the African world, has seen fit to ban me, a Guyanese, a black man, and an African. Now, notice how he describes himself. He says, I'm Guyanese. I'm from Guyana. I'm a black man, and I'm also an African. So he's being very deliberate about his identification. Black and being a black man is about black consciousness and black power, but he's saying he's also an African. He's connecting himself with the rest of the African world. But this is not very surprising because though the composition of that government, its prime minister, the head of state, several leading personalities, though that composition happens to be predominantly black, as the brothers at home say, they are white hearted. They are white hearted. These men serve the interests of a foreign white capitalist system, and at home they uphold a social structure which ensures that the black man resides at the bottom of the social ladder. He's economically oppressed, and culturally he has no opportunity to express himself. That is a situation from which we move. So he writes about this banning, and he says these leaders, like so many leaders in the African world, be they black on the outside, are white hearted because they serve not the interests of the masses, they serve the interests of white capital. So that's what he talks about when he talks about the banning. The rest of the book, he goes on and talks about black power and its relevance. Again, this is a revolutionary time, 1968. Black power is on the lips of everyone. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud is the number one song among black people around the world. This is James Brown's song, came out in 1968. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And this is a qualitative change among black people. Because during slavery, during colonialism, black was associated with everything negative. Black people didn't want to be called black. If you called somebody black before the mid 1960s, they'd be ready to fight you. They'd say, no, I'm a Negro, or I'm colored, or I'm this and that. Don't you ever call me black. You put black in front of anything, that was the ultimate insult. You black dog, you black this, you black so and so. When the black power movement came around, they said, no, no, black is beautiful. Our lips, our hair, our noses, everything about us, the way we dance, the way we move, connecting back to African culture, this is beautiful. This is nothing to be sh ashamed of. I love being black. Love your black self. Dr. King, before he was assassinated in 1968, for most of his writing, you read anything and you hear any speeches from Dr. King, from the time he comes on the public scene, he's saying Negro. The Negro needs to do this. The Negro has to do this. We have to respect the rights of the Negro. Negro, Negro, Negro. By the time we get to 1968, Dr. King is now saying black. He's saying, I'm black and I'm beautiful. Have black pride. So it's a qualitative change. People are no longer, black men used to conk their hair. They used to take uh, potatoes and lie and mix it up and put it on the comb and put it in their hair so they could straighten their hair fried, dyed, laid to the side, all that. But no, with black power, that's when the natural comes. You saw Walter Rodney's natural. You see people have the natural. The natural comes. We call it afro. So all these things are elements of black power and black pride. So this is what's happened in 1968. So the book talks about what that means. And not only that, what black power means in Africa and the Caribbean. 
Because for many people, they're like, okay, we can kind of understand what black power means in the context of a United States or a Canada or a South Africa, where you have a white government in control of black people. Yeah, those people should have black power. But, you know, in Africa or in the Caribbean, everybody's black. So why do we need to talk about black power? Well, Rodney had an answer for that. Because he says, on this occasion, on the topic of this occasion, is no longer just black power, but black power in you. Black power can be seen as a movement and an ideology springing from the reality of oppression of black peoples by whites within the international world as a whole. Now we need to be specific in defining the West Indian scene and our own particular roles in this society. You and I have to decide whether we want to think black or to remain as a dirty version of white. Black power in the West Indies means three closely related things. Number one, the break with imperialism, which is historically white races. So these are all the countries that seek to dominate black resources and black labor on the international scale. That's imperialism. Number two, the assumption of power by the black masses in the islands. So not the black folks that seek to exploit other black folks, but the black working masses. And number three, the cultural reconstruction of the society in the image of the blacks. So black power is just as relevant in Africa and in the Caribbean as it is in the United States, because what it's saying is we want our leaders to think black and think and, and act and move in the interests of the black masses. It's not enough to just have physically black people in these positions of power. If they think white and they're white hearted and they're pro-imperialist and they're pro-American and French and German and Belgian and all these companies coming in and to exploit resources, they're not serving the masses. So we still need black power in Africa, in the Caribbean. He said black power is not racially intolerant. He wanted to make that clear because a lot of people think, well, if you say black power, that means you want to hurt white people. You want to attack white people. You don't have anything. He said, no, black power is not about that. We're not racially intolerant. It is the hope of the black man that he should have power over his own destiny. This is not incompatible with the multiracial society where each individual counts equally. Because the moment that power is equally distributed among several ethnic groups, then the very relevance of making the distinction between groups will be lost. What we must object to is the current image of a multiracial society living in harmony. That is a myth designed to justify the exploitation suffered by the blackest of our population at the hands of the lighter skinned groups. So he's saying he wants true multiracialism. Not what we have now, which is a myth of multiracial harmony. Because that's what the first thing people put up. So you're talking about black power. We're trying to all live together as one. Yeah, that's great. But you have to give up some power for that to happen. And he, this is what Rodney is telling us in, in this section. This is all connected to this concept of black consciousness. So at the same time Rodney is articulating this in Jamaica and in Guyana and in Tanzania as he's moving around the world, it's also being articulated in South Africa by Steve Biko. We talked about Steve Biko last year. Steve Biko, Bantu Steve Biko was a revolutionary. He was a writer. He was a student organizer in South Africa during the height of apartheid. And he came up with the concept, the articulation of the concept of black consciousness. Black consciousness, the realization by the black man of the need to rally together with his brothers around the cause of their oppression, the blackness of their skin. He said, that's the reason why you're oppressed. Let's, let's get right to it. In South Africa, you are oppressed because your skin is black and because you're African that has resources and labor that can be exploited. And to operate as a group in order to rid themselves of the shackles that bind them to perpetual servitude. It seeks to demonstrate the lie that black is an aberration from the normal, which is white. It is the manifestation of a new realization that by seeking to run away from themselves and to emulate the white man, Blacks are insulting the intelligence of whoever created them black. It's very key. Stop trying to be what you are not. Embrace the beauty that is blackness. Embrace the culture that is African culture. This is what's going to liberate us, not trying to imitate Europeans. Um, so this is what's going on all over the continent, that, that we're seeing this. And it's rising because you have so many liberation movements that are occurring at the time. Uh, and this is just, I wanted to show you who Bantu Steve Biko was. Um, and we don't need, I won't read that entire quote. It's moving in Brazil, the country with the most black people outside of Nigeria. They're having their own black consciousness movement. 
a lot of it was sparked by the killing in 1978 by Robson Silva de Luz. Just like a lot of things happened in 2020 after the killing of George Floyd, when the police killed this brother, the black Brazilian population was remobilized. And at the time, Brazil was under a military regime, and the black people got together in the face of military repression. And they say, we're black and we're proud. Because Brazil was just like everywhere else. Blacks were at the lowest of the low in terms of economic outcomes, social outcomes, all of this. So, and no one in Brazil wanted to be black because black was associated with poor and illiteracy and, and all these negative things. So Brazil had its own black consciousness movement. The unified movement against racial discrimination turned into the, uh, the national black movement, the unified black movement, excuse me. They established National Black Consciousness Day on November 20th, 1979, or 1978, uh, where they decided that we don't want the Brazilian government, which get, try to give us a day, they said, we'll make the Emancipation uh, Day, Black People's Day, when we emancipated, we, we ended slavery in Brazil. The black Brazilians say, no, we don't want that. We want our own day that we decide, and it'll be the day honoring our great freedom fighter, Zumbi. So, and this black consciousness is spreading from South Africa to Brazil. You got Brazilian activists like Leila Gonzalez and Beatrice Nascimento who are talking about quilombismo and black consciousness and, and all this. It's spreading all over the world at this time. Uh, the other element that's brought up in the groundings. So he goes, he talks about the banning, he talks about black power and black consciousness. He also talks about class struggle in the black world. This idea that we have these working classes of black people that are being exploited, and they're not going to be exploited forever, and that's eventually going to lead to this revolution. That's going to make things more just. Um, and he used himself as an example. He said, let us have a look at our present condition. Most of us who have studied at UWI are discernibly black, and yet we are undeniably a part of the white imperialist system. A few are actively pro-imperialist. They have no confidence in anything that is not white. They talk nonsense about black people being lazy, the same nonsense which is said about the Jamaican black man after emancipation, although he went to Panama and performed the, the giant task of building the Panama Canal, the same nonsense which is said about the West Indian unemployed today, and yet they proceed to England to run the whole transport system. Most of us do not go to quite the same extremes in denigrating ourselves and our black brothers. But we say nothing against the system. And that means that we are acquiescing in the exploitation of our brethren. One of the ways that the situation has persisted, especially in recent times, is that it has given a few individuals like you and I a vision of personal progress measured in terms of front lawns and of the latest model of a huge American car. This has recruited us into their ranks and deprived the black masses of articulate leadership. That is why at the outset, I stressed that our choice was to remain as a part of the white system or to break with it. There's no other alternative. And when you talk about the white system, you talk about the white capitalist system. What he's saying in this, and he's talking to university students, and this goes on today in 2023. The goal of the university is to take young people but in, in the case of black folks and, 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 and African students, Caribbean students, it's to take us away from our people. That's, I teach at the university. I know what it's what about, <laughs> what's happening. The desire is we want to show you that you can use your talents to keep this system intact. So even if you're not saying out of your mouth that, you know what, black people can't do but so much, Africa can't do but so much, I'm just going to join this system. You're not saying that, but by not challenging the system, you're upholding it. And the university says, look, we're going to get you a fancy, you're going to do your work, we're going to get you a fancy job, get you a nice house, a big car, and don't worry about struggle, because you're not struggling. So don't worry about the masses of your people. You can drive this brand new electric car and go from place to place. Don't worry about where the coltan in that car came from and the people suffering in the Congo. Don't worry about the lithium in that car and where it came from, the people suffering in Bolivia. Don't worry about the bauxite in your house and the people uh, you know, suffering to breathe in Jamaica and in Guinea where that bauxite is being mined. Don't worry about that because guess what? You're better than those people. That's what's implicitly being taught. Now it takes a, a, a scholar like Walter Rodney and others to say, no, 
I might be in this position as a university professor, but I'm going to teach you what's really going on and how you can make sure that you're not brought up in that. Because this is the problem that we have in the African world. It's a class struggle. We got people that have and that exploit, and a whole mass of people that don't have that are trying to work, just trying to make a living. And then you got people in the middle that aren't actively exploiting, but they're not saying anything and doing anything about the masses of our people that are being exploited. This is the group that many of us belong to. We're in that middle. We're not actively exploiting anybody. We don't own any mines. We don't own any uh, 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 factories. Yet we don't say anything about the exploitation that goes on in these mines, that goes on in these factories, the rampant unemployment, the government repression. We're not doing anything. So this is who Rodney is talking about. And when that group decides that they're going to connect with the interests of that group, that, that masses of our people that are being exploited, then we have this change that needs to occur. So um, let me stop here. Uh, actually, I'll go, I'll go a little bit more, then, then I'll stop. So I mentioned at this Congress, one of the people that was articulating a lot of these same ideas of Walter Rodney was this man here, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture. Stokely Carmichael, from Trinidad, he grew up in New York. Just like what Walter Rodney talked about, he went to university. A very bright student. He could have been one of those people that joined that middle class of black folks that got the education, got a nice job, didn't care about the masses of black people. He chose not to. When he was in university at Howard University, this is when the civil rights movement was happening. He decided instead of pursuing this degree, which would have made him a university professor and he could have just lived life uh, in, in the lap of luxury, he's going to go down south and fight for the civil rights of black people in Mississippi in the 1960s, the most white controlled terroristic state in the United States. He decided to go down there to help black people register to vote, for black people to get their civil and human rights. As a result of that, he was arrested. He was beaten, he was attacked, he was pepper sprayed, all of these things. He was arrested probably, only person arrested more times than Stokely Carmichael may have been Martin Luther King Jr. in the South. He was arrested that many times fighting for black people's rights. He put his life on the line. So many civil rights workers were killed in Mississippi in the 1960s and he was down there organizing as a part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Through that organizing, he starts something in Alabama because he moves from Mississippi to organizing in Alabama called the Lowndes County Freedom Organization in 1964, who took as their symbol the Black Panthers. So this is actually the first Black Panther Party in the United States in 1964 in Lowndes County, Alabama. So Stokely Carmichael is organizing. And although he starts his career as an advocate for nonviolence, because of all his experiences in Mississippi and Alabama and in the South, he starts to listen more to Malcolm X. And this idea of self-defense becomes crucial to who he is. And they're not willing to be nonviolent anymore. And although he's a close ally with Dr. King, in 1966, this is when black power reaches the international stage. Because the youth were tired of getting beat. They're tired of getting pepper sprayed and, and hit with fire hoses and police dogs and not being able to do anything about it. So they told Dr. King that, Dr. King, look, we know the slogan for the civil rights movement has been freedom now. But we want a new slogan called black power. And black power means black economic power, black political power, black social power. And we're going to bring out this new slogan. Dr. King was very wary about black power. He was like, I don't know what that means. It sounds very similar to white power. I'm not really for it. Uh, let's stick to freedom now. And they couldn't agree on that. So there was this, uh, a rally in Mississippi, Greenwood, Mississippi in 1966. And Stokely Carmichael had just gotten pepper sprayed again for the umpteenth time, just been arrested again. He gets out of jail. He gets on stage at the rally. And one of his comrades, Willie Ricks, and some others, they say, we need to bring out the slogan tonight. So they, the people in Greenwood are, are, are around, and they're listening. And Stokely Carmichael and Willie Ricks go, what do we want? And they tell the people to say, black power. And the people go, black power, black power. We want black power. And that was picked up in the news, and it went all over the world. And this is kind of the beginnings of this black power movement. And Stokely Carmichael is considered the leader of the youth because he's only, uh, let's see, he's only 19, he's only 25 years old 
1966. He's 25 years old, and he's the leader of this newly emerging black power movement. Now, all of this really explodes two years later when Dr. King is killed, because Dr. King was the only person that was holding a lid on a lot of people, because a lot of people were still holding out hope that change could occur nonviolently. But when they killed Dr. King, all bets were off. How can you kill the guy that wasn't even going to do anything to you? He was talking about nonviolence. Why, why would you kill him? So Stokely Carmichael and the advocates for black power become more known on an international level. And he gives a, a number of speeches, and he's organizing the African masses. And it's not just about Africans in America for Stokely Carmichael, because again, he's from Trinidad. It's about Africans all over the world. And he eventually is highlighted by the FBI as somebody that should be taken out. We got these you know, declassified FBI documents from the time, and the FBI is saying, uh, we need to prevent the rise of a black messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. Malcolm X may have been such a messiah, but he's the martyr of the movement today. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and Elijah Muhammad all aspire to this position. Elijah Muhammad is less of a threat because of his age. King could be a very real contender for this position should he abandon his supposed obedience to white liberal doctrines, nonviolence. Carmichael has the necessary charisma to be a real threat in this way. This is what the FBI was saying. This came out in 1967. A year later, Dr. King would be killed, and they would continue to uh, you know, monitor and harass and do all these things against Stokely Carmichael. If you want to read more about Stokely Carmichael's life, Ready for the Revolution, his uh, autobiography, Stokely Speaks, number one of his uh, uh, readings, you'll see that he eventually changes his name to Kwame Ture. This happens when he goes to Africa. He travels to Africa in 1967. He meets Kwame Nkrumah, who had just been deposed as president of Ghana by the CIA and the re reactionary forces in, inside of Ghana, the armed forces. He becomes the prime minister of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in 1968, and he's going back and forth between Africa and the US. But eventually, he becomes uh, a secretary of Kwame Nkrumah, who's in exile. Well, not in exile. He's a co-president of Guinea. Whole nother story. And he helps to organize what Nkrumah has in his mind, this organization called the All African People's Revolutionary Party, an organization that was going to be made up of Africans all over the world who were going to be fighting to, to, to create liberated zones, to take over the state and create states that actually served African people. So he would spend the rest of his life, Kwame Ture, organizing this political party, which was outlined in the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, a political organization that would be active in every country that Africans were, organizing African people to create a United States of Africa that would serve the interests of African people. All right, uh, let's stop there, because one of the things that we'll get into is what happens when these ideas become active in a place that was never colonized. What happens when these ideas of black power and class struggle become active in Ethiopia, among Ethiopian students, where it's no white people to resist? We're going to talk about that after the break. Uh, let me open it up to questions and, and, and comments. So Daniel, anything in the chat or any hands? Uh, David H's hands. I knew <laughs> my brother David H. David H, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Danny, sir. <laughs> um, oh, how, let me get this question right. Um, the, the, from what I'm understanding, all the movements were geared at, um, they understood that Europeans we're setting the standard and setting the stage for pretty much the world. And they understood that this was not the direction they wanted to go, but did they have a, a functional replacement for if they were to overthrow or remove the European influence, did they have a functional replacement that they would go to, that they would teach? Because from what I'm seeing or hearing, there was no real replacement, it was always just get rid of the European influence, but then do the same with the less European flavor? Like, uh, yeah. did I miss something? Yes, so, um, I didn't explain it. So in, in Tanzania, where Rodney had taught 
they were practicing the African socialism as uh, explained by Julius Nyerere and others in Tanzania. So throughout Africa at this time, you had certain leaders that were actually doing their best to look at non-European, non-capitalist ways of organizing economies and, and, and polities. One was in Tanzania, and Krumah was uh, going along those lines in Ghana. And then the main feature, one of the main features of Walter Rodney's book is that he was a historian to looking at African history for those exact models of what the development should look like. So part of his project was not just looking at history for facts and figures and dates. He was trying to find models, economic and political models, that could be used in the modern times. And in fact, at the end of this book, there's a postscript by um, Muhammad uh, Babu. I think, is it, is it Babu? Uh, yeah, A.M. Babu, who was the basically the Minister of Development, Economic Development in Tanzania, who talks about those alternative models that, if used, would help you know, stimulate development and all those things that the masses actually wanted in Africa. So yeah, you had folks that were articulate. Not enough, though. You had Sekou Toure in Guinea. You had Kwame Nkrumah in, in Ghana. You had Nyerere in Tanzania who were trying to think about different models of development um, to move away from that. So yeah, you had those, but they weren't um, they were constantly under attack, number one, by the West. And um, those ideas didn't get as much. And then you had the intellectuals at the time who were also responsible for disseminating these ideas. Many of them weren't like Walter Rodney and others. So these ideas stayed in universities. And they weren't, university folks weren't going to these groundings and talking to the people about, hey, here's an alternative, or, or even allowing the people themselves to come up with their own alternatives. They were suppressed by you know, the uh, bourgeois leaders who didn't want to hear about these alternatives. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, the, so, what's, so why is that not happening? Like, as, that's happening today, then. Like, yeah, these the ideas thing. are there, yeah. and they're still being suppressed, which is why, I mean, I'm, that's why I'm asking you for the correction, not everybody <laughs> on the news, because, I mean, yeah. I'm not, I haven't heard anything like this yeah. anywhere it's, other than your class. It, that, this, is, this, is, this is what Rodney was going to do. And, and let me go back, because there's something I forgot to mention about uh, Rodney. Um, well, two things. One is, I hope I'm, I, I, when I read Walter Rodney, and I get to this part of the class, um, it makes me feel bad because sometimes I'm like, man, I must not be teaching right because I haven't been banned yet. Um, <laughs> I'm like, what do I got to do to get banned? No, uh, but th th that when he was banned, the masses in Jamaica uprose. It was called the, the Rodney Riots. It started with the students at UWI when they found out that they wouldn't let Rodney off the plane and that they were banning him from the country. The, people, the, the students uprose. And then the students were joined by the working masses who Rodney had been amongst, the Rastafarians, the working class people, the youth in the slums and, and Kingston and all these places where respectable people wouldn't go. He would be in the gullies and in these places and in the schools and the churches and, and, and all these areas where they would have these groundings. All of those people and, and then other people who had never even met Rodney, who were just tired of being exploited, tired of the prices going up and tired of employment going down and all these things. They rose up, and the Rodney riots were a huge turning point, even politically in Jamaica, because that government was soon replaced by another government. It was the, uh, somebody asked Jamaica, can let me know. I think it was the PNP was replaced by the, or no, somebody in Jamaica, somebody asked Jamaica, let me know. I think the Labor Party was replaced by the PNP. I think that's what, I know Manley comes in in 72. Uh, but you have a, a change politically. Uh, so the Labour Party, the Labour Party replaced the PNP. That's what it is. Thank yeah, you. Is, I'm not the first person. No, no. Shearer was JLP. So yeah, and Randy was PNP. Shearer so, was the first man to the yeah, yeah. So you were right, Doctor Ledbetter. It's the PNP that replaced the JLP, JLP. because okay. Shearer was JLP. And Mandy That's thank you, thank you so much. So th yes, that is what we had these these riots, and it's funny uh, how all this connects because one of the main people in the riots uh, was Peter Tosh. 
Peter Tosh commandeered a school bus and drove it through a department store uh, with all these people on it, and then they uh, took a whole bunch of stuff from the department store. Um, and, and so there's a whole lot of stuff going on in Jamaica at the time. So, but the people rioted. When, uh, these these Rodney riots were important. I forgot to mention that when when that happened. Um, but yeah, this is what we're dealing with today. It's even worse today than it was, because at least back then in 1968, you had a social milieu where black power and these ideas were even on the lips of young people in high schools, and, and, and they were having these debates in colleges and universities. You don't have a lot of that now. They've made its university so expensive that people are afraid to speak out for anything. Really, uh, uh, that's revolutionary. You get you know some Black Lives Matter stuff and different things like that. but. People are so concerned of how do I get the jobs so I can pay off these student loans that you don't have the same level of student activism that you had in the 60s. And then you also don't have a professorate, academics, who are also paying off student loans like myself. Uh, I mean, I'm not one of these academics, but they're paying off student loans. They're trying to get these things. So they're not, they're not having these groundings. What we're doing right now is, is type of groundings because this class is open to everybody. Anybody from Mont that's on Montreal Road right now can come up here and come into this room. I wish I was doing this outside so that people walking past me, maybe that's what we'll do next year. <laughs> maybe we'll have these outside so that anybody can listen to it. But that's the whole point, is to get this information out to all of our people so that we can actually make this change but, and, and do the things that, that we talked about. So that's where we're at with that. Um, Mr. Francis, uh, go ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ledbetter, and as always, it's a beautiful um, lecture today. I will have a couple of um, observations and a, a question. Um, Hugh Scherer, who was the Prime Minister of Jamaica that uh, banned uh, Walter Rodney, he had a brother in Toronto who was a very good friend of mine. His name was George Scherer. I wish I had this information from today's um, lecture so George and I could have had a good discussion. <laughs> uh, and uh, George has passed away. And, um, and many of the academics from the Caribbean uh, who went to abroad to study, one of the common denominators they had upon completion was to return home with a white wife. Mm. And uh, my question here is this. Stokely Carmichael, if my memory serves me right, was married to Miriam Makiba at one time, after um, Hugh Masekela. Oh, I'm wondering, where did they meet? Because Miriam was um, exiled from a homeland in South Africa. So where did they meet, do you know? I'm not sure. I don't know if it was in the States. I know, I think in 1968, she was with him at, the, at the, the, the Congress of Black Writers in Montreal. I believe she was there. I'm not sure exactly where they met. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I got to look that up. I think it was in the States, though. But it's really interesting the toll that uh, you know, the CIA and the FBI took on that relationship as well, on, on a lot of people's relationships. You know, and the, these, these folks that were speaking out and were organizing black people, they were constantly being surveyed and, and attacked in different ways by the FBI, the CIA, and these other forces, international forces as well, um, which took a toll on that relationship. But yeah, they were kind of an it couple for a while uh, of, of black, black folks that were committed to struggle and, and had a, a, an air of celebrity. Yeah, but I'm not sure where they met. Daniel, is there anything in the chat before I go to the second half of this? Um, no, there's nothing in the chat. Okay. I have a question. Okay, like, yep. It was obvious, and I've seen, like, the mention of black power and the definition of it. How is it they're not able, like, the whole country, how is it they're not able to come together and fight against the Europe and the problems of it? Because I've seen, like, yeah. The, the, the issue is two parts. One um, is education, is spreading the message to the people that actually need to hear. We got to do a better job at that. Too many of our education systems, even back home, are still very Eurocentric. Even though it's not white people, it's still you learn more about Europe than you learn about your own African heritage. The second part is we got too many of our leaders are in 
are want to hold on to their little bit of power versus to have everybody come together. So they would rather be president of a place like the Gambia than you know, a senator in the United States of Africa or something like that. So that's the, the, the dual struggle, is we need to reshape our understanding of what leadership is. And I'm going to talk more about that actually next week when we talk about Thomas Sankara and um, how he's remembered or not remembered versus how Mandela is remembered. And having things like that, if we knew who Sankara was and his type of leadership, we would look at our leaders different. And then that would allow us to ask these questions about, okay, well, why aren't we united? How do we get united? How do we do these types of things? Because it's not just a unification in terms of in relation to Europe and America, because that's one thing, but it's also unification because these economists and, and political leaders, they've looked at the situation and they said, we need larger areas. E even regionally, we just need larger areas so we have more internal markets, so we don't have all these borders where you gotta pay taxes to go over this place. And Africa's starting to get toward that because we got this new uh, free African trade zone which is supposed to put an end to a lot of that. Um, but we, more work needs to be done, more conscious building, more classes like this. And this question was asked by one of the young people who you all will hear from next week. And this is part of the project. This is part of what we're doing is we're getting this history into the minds of the young people because I can't do this forever. We've been doing this for five years. I want to, I'm going to continue doing this class as long as I can, but I, I don't want to be like one of our African leaders that's not prepared for the future. So that's why there's young people here that are learning, that are learning how to teach, they're learning this history so that they can spread it and keep spreading it. Uh, so that's, that's what we're doing. So thank you for that question. Thank you for that question. I'm actually going to go back to the continent right now. So while all this is going on, there's a group of students that are studying in the United States, that are studying in Europe, and they're reflecting back on their own country, a country that wasn't colonized, a country that, again, was this shining example, which was Ethiopia. And their leader, by the time we get to the 1970s, Emperor Haile Selassie has been the leader since 1930, so 40 years of the same regime, a regime that was built as an empire, remember, he's the emperor of Ethiopia. Empires are usually not voluntary organizations. The Ethiopian empire, as we know it in the 1970s, was built about a century earlier, in the 1880s, 1890s, where you have a, three successive emperors. You have Emperor Tedros in the 1860s, Emperor Johannes, and then Emperor Menelik II, the one that beat the Italians. And we applaud Emperor Menelik and Empress Taitu for defending Ethiopia against the Italians. But what we failed to look internally at is what was going on in Ethiopia. Ethiopia was an empire, meaning the emperor was conquering people and bringing them into the Ethiopian kingdom. Those conquered people were hyper-exploited. As the empire expanded south, into the land of the Oromo and the Afar uh, uh, and the uh, Sidamo and the Somalis. As they, the empire expanded, those people's lands were taken over and they were incorporated forcefully into this empire that everybody else celebrated ex externally because people didn't know what was going on inside of Ethiopia. So during his regime, Haile Selassie sought to modernize Ethiopia. He, he made these attempts. He wanted to you know, continue the centralization of the government. So he wanted to make this empire a true government and a true nation state. He wanted to uh, replace the autonomy of local officials, local government officials, to solidify his control centrally over the Ethiopian empire. And he created a new government bureaucracy that was based off of skill and not necessarily, you know, nepotism. So he tried to do that. Um, the land during his time was still under a feudal system, meaning you had the emperor at the top, and then you actually had people that were royalty and governors that were beneath the emperor that controlled huge amounts of land. 
and they exploited the people that worked them. Those, those people didn't own the land. They worked on the land. This is a feudal system where you have a king, you have nobles, you have governors, and then you have the masses and military officials, and then you have the masses of people that don't own the land that they work on, that don't control the resources that they produce. At the end of the growing season, the landlord is coming to take a portion of those goods. In addition, the Ethiopian church is also in tandem with the emperor. The church takes its cut of what you produce. So at the end of the year, you have very little to show from all your work, and plus you don't own the land that you work on. And this was even worse in the south, the southern part of the country that had been brought into the empire in the late 19th century. So the masses of Ethiopians, 90% of Ethiopians were under control of this system, and they were hyper-exploited, the poorest of the poor. And then on top of all of that, as we know, that region of Africa has periodic famines, periodic droughts, I should say. And I'm, I want to be very clear about this distinction, because this is important to point out. A drought is a natural phenomenon. It happens all over the world, different uh, you know, areas of the world. California has been in drought-like conditions for a long time. A drought is when rainfall is not sufficient for the amount of crops you're trying to grow and things you're trying to do. That's natural. It happens. Famine is man-made and caused by the actions of governments and men. There's been drought-like conditions in California, but there hasn't been a famine in California. People aren't starving in California because Californians can easily get food from Nebraska and Ohio and Iowa and these places. In Ethiopia, you had droughts in regions of the country, but not everybody was starving. The rich people were living incredibly well and fat and doing all this. It's the poor people that were starving and suffering because of how government allocates resources and how they allow the wealthy to exploit the underclass and the working class. Famines are man-made catastrophes. You can manage a drought if you plan accordingly, if you save grain, if you uh, equitably distribute food, if you work with other countries to get the food in and do these things. You can avoid famine, particularly in modern times. There's no reason there should be famines in, in, two, in, in the 20th century. There's no reason there should be famines. Droughts, unavoidable. Famines, very much avoidable. So all this was happening. But at the same time, while Selassie is trying to modernize the country, he realizes that he doesn't have enough people for his government bureaucracy to actually run the government. So a lot of these poor people now start to end up going to school. The, univers the university is opened up, and Selassie is educating these people. And when these people get education, they're getting angry because <laughs> they're seeing the inequality very starkly. In 1960, it was a failed military coup to overthrow Haile Selassie. The military decided that hey, enough is enough, and they tried to overthrow him. It didn't work. Um, two of the leaders of this coup were right before they were executed. One of the two brothers kind of orchestrated this coup. Uh, they said, woe to you and your master. One dreads to think of the calamity that awaits you when the people of Ethiopia fully understand my intentions and rise against you in unison. This is the last thing that one of the brothers said before he was executed, because this coup was done by uh, some senior military officials, some uh, uh, intellectuals, and others. And they attempted to uh, overthrow Selassie and put his son in charge, uh, but the son um, Really wasn't for. He was trying to. They were trying to force the son to be the new leader. But uh, the coup was. Um, it wasn't successful. But this was just the first instance of the unrest in Ethiopia in 1960. So throughout the 60s, things kind of continued as they were. The emperor was at the top of the social regime. People in the middle getting fat off the uh, the the wealth and and the exploited labor of 90 percent of the population. So a number of things happened. One. The groups that made up uh, the, the revolution included the urban and, and, and rural working class, leftist student groups, and the military itself was starting to become unhappy with the regime. The urban and rural proletariats were vehemently opposed to the policies of the imperial government. So you got this working class, you got teachers, you got taxi drivers, you got all these people that are workers in Ethiopia 
that feel like the government isn't responding to their needs. And then the people in the rural areas, the ones that are being hyper-exploited, of course, they're not happy. You got these unions that were radicalized. You got these students that were ready for change. And the revolution had uh, a... Me, the, me, uh, the union membership, the Confederation of uh, Ethiopian Labor Unions, had 150,000 members. So unions were incredibly active at this time. The students were the most radical group in the country. These were students, again, a lot of them were poor. They had come from the rural areas. They had come from the, the poor sections of the urban areas. They're learning about black power. They're learning about all the anti-colonial movements that are happening in Africa. And even the Ethiopian students that are studying abroad, that are studying in the United States, that are studying in Europe, they formed the Ethiopian Students Organization. And they're starting to think about, wait a minute, you know, it's really messed up where we come from. Our people are being hyper-exploited. So they started to organize things like conferences that talked about land to the tiller. We should give the land to the people that actually work the land and not the people that are exploiting them. So you had two major questions that arose in Ethiopia among the student organizations. One was the land question. Everybody agreed, if you're poor and you work the land, you should own the land. You shouldn't be exploited. The second question, not everybody agreed upon. Now, this is very important because this affects Ethiopia today. Because Ethiopia was an empire that was recently built, that was built in the late 1800s, you had the national question. Some people said, we don't really want to be a part of Ethiopia. We want our area to be independent. We want Somal the Somali part of Ethiopia to be a part of a greater Somaliland. We want the Oromo controlled part of Ethiopia to be its own country. We want to separate. We want Eritrea to be its own country. We don't want to be a part of this empire anymore. But then you had some students that said, look, let's not separate. Let's just form one Ethiopia. We'll get rid of the emperor, but we'll form one Ethiopia where everybody's rights are respected. So both sides kind of had their, 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 their points, their good points and their bad points. On the one hand, yeah, people should have the, the right to choose whether they become part of a unified government because it was an empire. They were brought in by force. So yeah, they should be able to choose. But on the other hand, the students that were saying, well, but if we create a situation where everybody is taken care of, why would you want to separate? And it would be better if we stay together because we'll be a stronger country. So they both have their, had their good points. So the students are, are you know, engaging in this discussion intellectually. But back on the ground in Ethiopia, though, a number of things happened that would spark off a revolution where the people, the masses, would finally say, enough is enough, we're, we're revolting. 1973, you have another famine, a famine in the Wello and Tigray regions. And Tigray was in the news you know, the past two years because this is where the Ethiopian, the latest war in Ethiopia was fought, in, in Tigray mostly. Um, there was a famine in these regions. Famine creates unrest. When people are hungry, Bob Marley and them say, a hungry man is an angry man. The people are angry. They're hungry. In January 1974, the army, there's mutinies in the army. The army no longer, the soldiers in the army who aren't being paid well, who feel like they're being exploited, they rebel against their senior officers. Then there's a teacher strike. Then there's a taxi driver strike. Then the prime minister resigns. And then in, in order to try to save everything, they do a bunch of constitutional amendments that try to weaken the power of the monarchy and do different things, but that doesn't work. And then 100,000 Muslims rally for religious equality. A lot of people think Ethiopia is a completely Christian country. It's not. You have a lot of Muslims that were saying, hey, we're being uh, underappreciated and exploited in the regime. So then the Muslims rally. By the time we get to June 1974, Junior officers in the military create something called the DERG or the committee. And these junior officers are like, we see what's going on in the rest of the continent of Africa. We have these military coups. Maybe it's time for the military to take over. September 1974, the emperor is overthrown. The junior officers in the military take over the country. And at first, they're aligned with the students. And these students still can't get over this land question and what they're going to do, ultimately the Derg takes over. 
the Derg does some revolutionary things at first, including the 1975 Land Proclamation, probably the most radical thing that they do, where they create a law that the people that work on the land will actually own the land, probably the most uh, significant land reform in African history. Because this changed centuries of relations in Ethiopia, where the poor people actually controlled their land. It's the first time that this happened. This is a revolution. Uh, the peasants control over their own affairs by providing the creation for peasants associations uh, and uh, with broad powers over land distribution and rural development. So this was a great move. Uh, in this land reform, it's the most enduring effect of the Ethiopian revolution, like I said. However, the revolutionary moves made by the Derg didn't last long. Because what you had, you had these officials, particularly led by uh, Mengustu, who decided that, you know what, I'd rather just have all the power myself. And the Derg uh, did things. They, neutral, see, uh, they neutralized the students. It uh, neutralized intellectuals. And the Derg basically replaced the emperor as the repressive regime as we get into the later parts of the 1970s. But this was, this was, um, and this is Mengistu here, uh, as the 1970s progressed, the Derg proved unable to effectively deal with the problems it helped to create. Um, it attacked the leftist groups, the intellectuals, a lot of people left the country, and the Derg essentially, yeah, they just replaced the emperor. And they tried to suppress the land question themselves which would lead to another civil war and issues that still aren't resolved in Ethiopia today. However, the Ethiopian revolution is an example of what happens when you push the masses to the point that they see no other uh, remedy other than revolution. And that's the truest expression of black power. When the black masses, whether they're fighting against black leadership or white leadership, but when the masses decide that enough is enough, and they're ready to change things, they'll do it. The question is, right, was asked when we watched the Battle of Algiers, what happens afterwards? How do you create a situation where the interests of the masses are maintained after the change in power? Because what we had in Ethiopia is the masses were, again, neutralized, but this time by the military. So these are unanswered questions, but history gives us a lot to think about. History gives us a lot to assess so that we don't make these same mistakes again. So we're going to stop there for today, because this takes us up to the 1980s. And what we're going to get into next week, we're going to look at, again, two, uh, two pieces of literature. We will look at part of my heart went with me, with, with him, uh, the memoir by Winnie Mandela uh, concerning Nelson Mandela's incarceration and her political activism. We'll read that. And we will also look at the memoir of Benedita de Silva, uh, activists, black women activists from Brazil. We're going to look at how African women who are representations of the African working masses in the 80s and in the 90s dealt with the neoliberal order, dealt with the changes that would occur after apartheid ended in the 1990s. And we'll talk about leadership and African women's role in that. Uh, so that's what we'll look at next week. We have two more sessions left. Next week, you'll also hear from the youth about the African History Project that they're working on. So you'll hear from three youth next week, and we'll take it from there. So uh, thank you all for, for listening. We will resume again next week. I want everyone to keep the 24th open. If you can come here in person on the 24th, if you're able, please do, because we want to recognize those of you that have been with us to uh, all of these seminars and courses, uh, and we have some certificates we want to pass out and some different things you want to do. So if you can come here in, purpose, in person on the 24th, uh, please do. As, as always, um, I want to thank you all. Stay safe, and we will talk soon. Before I close out, let me go to the hands and uh, any community announcements that folks may have. So uh, Mr. Francis, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick one, Doctor. And what is the reason for the exploitation in Ethiopia? And who were the people being exploited there? So you had two levels of exploitation. One, it was a, it was a monarchy. <laughs>